Okay. Okay, Anna, let's go ahead and get started. If you can tell us a little bit about, uh, from what you remember, about who Malachi York was. Well, I know that I didn't know who he was as a young child because my mother had moved me and my sister into what it was called at the time, the um, Ansaru Allah community. And it was an Islamic community. And it was in uh, Bushwick, um, on Bushwick Avenue, Hart Street. And it was in Brooklyn, New York. And I think uh, maybe as I got a little bit older, maybe I started, you know, realizing like, oh, who, who he was. I know he was like supposed to be the imam over, over the Islamic community. And that's who people, you know, knew him as Imam Easter. And um, yeah, he was over the whole community. And I remember like back then it was like, um, we would go to the masjid and pray. Um, we would go to- What was that like? You know, we, um, it was, I think we might've prayed maybe about like, I'm thinking like three times a day. So it was like, you go in there and you would have to like wash, do like, um, wash your face, wash your ears and stuff like that. Probably wash your feet before you go into the masjid to pray. And then, you know, you would go in there and, and do your prayer. And it was somebody that would lead the prayer. And uh, we also did, uh, you know, celebrated um, Ramadan. That was like during the fasting time of the Islamic holiday. And then they also had a time when it was like, you know, when Ramadan was over and it was time, you know, for people to eat it. It was like a festive time and stuff like that mm -hmm. and um I know like over time it seemed like that's when uh things started transitioning from the Islam you know the Muslim days from what I remember into um I believe like cowboys he started dressing up as cowboys and that's when he started to move down south no yeah no that he started to move upstate and I think that might have been like Cowboys, and then he called. He started calling himself Rabboni Yeshua, and um, it was like a lot of like Hebrew stuff that he was teaching people, and um, I guess it was supposed to be like kind of like Judaic teachings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's when he moved to upstate New York, and uh, that place was called Jezer Abba. So he he moved up there for a little bit before he moved to um, Edenton, Georgia. Okay, and then when we moved to Edenton, Georgia that's when the land was created and they called it Tamaray. And that's when, you know, people started building pyramids over there and um, all the other Egyptian, that's when he was teaching Egyptian um, teachings and that's when his name changed to um, Atumray. Yeah, he was called Atumray down there. And during that time, it was, um, yeah, everything was, was Egyptian. It was like two pyramids, it was the Black Pyramid and then it was another pyramid. And it was a Sphinx up there. It was uh, the train station. I remember the train station there. And then it was um, the Moo Garage, as they call it, where people, it was like a labyrinth that people went around. Before they got on, on the labyrinth, they had to like get misted with some type of like water spray. And then it had the beach area where it was like chairs and sand. And um, it was a stage over there. And then before you, got to it was like near the near the pyramid the black pyramid of uh, the Mugaraj they had it was like a bridge mm -hmm. under the bridge it was like water and then fishes and stuff like that from what I remember so that was around the time when he was it was all Egyptian everything so okay, around please. during I'm sorry go ahead and then during that time um I think slowly but surely that's when he started having conflicts with uh the sheriff in the town of Edenton. Conflicts with the sheriff. Okay, let's let's talk about that. But let me just go back for just a moment. So okay, gone from Islam to yes. cowboy type. Yes. Is that a religion or <laughs> I guess it's more of a practice? Is it mm. more of the clothing that he was wearing or just it was clothing. Okay. And then I don't think with the cowboys that it was a religion, but I know with Islam it was, and I know with when he was supposed to be Rabboni upstate new york it was um he was like supposed to be like teaching like judaic teachings okay because somebody told me that they were being taught hebrew and stuff like that so and then i know when we started uh, 
doing um the egyptian stuff he we did he did start talking about like the you know different egyptian um you know like deities and stuff like that and we were learning about them and everything was you know egyptian you know so they were you said that some people were learning to talk hebrew yes Uh uh-huh okay so all right so we're we're now we're in edenton georgia Mm -hmm. right Okay, you said that he was having problems with the sheriff. What type of um, issues do you remember? It was, it was zoning violations because he built uh, Ramesses and it was a nightclub on the land and it was he did not get permission to build it. So they basically were going back, Sheriff Sills and him were going back with the zoning violations. Okay. All and right. And then- I'm oh. sorry, go ahead. And then from there, I think that's when things started to escalate and uh, it was more investigations going on to like, who are these people? You know, who are these Nuwabians? Where did they come from? How long have they been here? Because before they kind of left them alone and didn't bother, you know, bother them and didn't care what they were really doing on this land. But um, when they when they started harassing the the sheriff, they started like making flyers. Uh, York started making flyers and, and bulletins of the sheriff and local officials and sending them all around the town of Edenton. That's when they started to, you know, get scared and like, okay, who, who, you know, who is this person? Why is he harassing everybody and what is going on? And it was because of the zoning violations. And around that time too, that's when the sheriff office started getting anonymous, um, anonymous letters from uh, sent to the police department about, you know, child molestation and things like that. But the sheriff claimed that they didn't take action because it wasn't a witness that came forward to say that these things happened to them. And they didn't, they didn't investigate any further or come to the land to see if those accusations were true, you know, to check on the children to see, you know, what was going on or, or anything. Okay, so let's go back for just uh, for just a, a little bit here. So okay. we know about who he is or who mm-hmm. you saw him to be. Yes. And how did how did you get to come to uh, in his presence and, and to even know about who he was? Um, hold, hold on. Uh, yeah, I just I just remembered. I, f- I forgot the part where he claimed to be related to the El Mahdi family from Sudan. I forgot about that part. Okay. So that was who he, he claimed to be as well. Sudanese from Sudan and related to the Al Mahdi family. But I think when I came into his, pre- well, I, I mean, I was around him. I was around in that community when I was little. But when I came into his presence is when I moved up to Edenton, Georgia. And I moved there with my mom originally. But then I moved to the land and I moved there by myself as a teenager and um, yeah, my mother wasn't living up there. And I think that was the first time that I actually got close to him to know him as a person instead of this Imam Isa or, you know. Right. You know. Okay, so you say initially you were there with your mom, of course. Yes. This was in New York, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then when, when they moved down to Edenton, Georgia, um, this is where you separated from your mom and you went to live because people need to understand that there were- I, people that yes. lived on the land and people that lived off the land. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So my mother lived off the land in the town of Edenton around that time. And I moved onto the land onto Tamaray around the time when, you know, I came to Tamaray to live and my mother did not move on to Tamaray with me. And how old were you? I was uh, 14 and oh. my sister was living there by herself too. And so how does that um, happen when you're, you know, you're 14, so you're not of legal age to, mm -hmm. so how did, how did that happen? Because, you know, we would be, my main concern would be, you know, what, what are the schools saying and how are you able to just live somewhere outside of your mom legally, you know? And I, I asked the same question. I'm not sure like how parents were so carefree with just sending it, you know, not sending, but just letting their children just go off and live on this land, Tamaray, by themselves, because it wasn't only my sister and it wasn't only me. It was like a lot of other, you know, girls that were underage and without their parents and they were living on Tamaray by themselves. 
And it's like, I don't think I really thought about it around that time because, you know, it seemed normal. But when I think about it now, I was just like, wow, we didn't have our parents there. And we were, you know, minors living up here by by ourselves. And it's like, I think, I don't know if I, I think I might have asked my mother, like, why would you let, you know, my Mm -hmm. sister and us go up there on our own? And, you know, you're our parent and, you know, we were there with our parents. And I don't think she really, like, answered the question. But it just makes me confused, too, because it was a lot of times when parents had their children around, you know, York, and they were not around them. Uh, you know, around their children to keep an eye on what's going on and what was happening. And I felt like maybe they trusted him because he considered himself, you know, any mom or this played himself up to be such an important person, like, a, you know, right, a community, right. you know, leader and figure that people just trusted. Oh, you know, my children are OK because, you know, they're in his presence, but they they weren't OK. Yeah, clearly. So mm-hmm. so you're 14. Your mom's off the land. You're on the land. Now, Mm -hmm. I'm going to just assume that because when you're coming from different states and stuff, you're either in school, you're not in school. So if you're coming from a different state and do you remember going to school in New York or just going to school with the the community or in the community? Okay, so the last time um, I remember uh, going to school was in New York Mm -hmm. and I was... um, I was a young child and I think I might've been in first grade, maybe first to second grade is the last time I remember going to a public school. Right. So I'm not sure why we ever got taken out of school. It was never explained, Mm -hmm. but I just know all of a sudden we so-called was considered homeschool. Okay. But, um, so it went from us uh, on the land they had, they had, it was a school called, um, the pyramid, but it really, it really wasn't inside of the pyramid at all. Mm-hmm. Where the school was located was inside of a, a shed. The shed was not, you know, like it didn't have any any walls in there. It wasn't even it didn't have any insulation. It wasn't like built like a building or even looked like a school. It was concrete floors, a lot of dust from what I remember. And you could still see the uh, the wood panels in the shed and the, you know, the stuffing in the shed. It was it had no walls. And that's what they call the so-called pyramid school. And I think we were in there being taught for a little bit. Then after a while that dissolved and it was like, we was just working. We was working as, as you know, uh, minors, children packing incense, soaps and whatever else that, you know, York had that he was selling to his, you know, organization and um, deodorants, whatever else, shampoos, conditioner, you know, we was just working. And not only were there underage children working, he had adults working around the clock for free and they were not getting paid for it. It was no, you know, you come in at five, you leave, come in at nine, you leave at five. It was like from morning to night mm-hmm. and it was no, you know, health coverage. It was no dental. It was no, you know, none of that. No money. Nobody was getting paid for, for their labor. It was just free labor. So it was free labor there on the land and he'd sell these soaps and incense and deodorants and whatever else you guys were packing up and he would sell yep. them to other companies organizations and get he had paid. stores he had stores called all mm-hmm. eyes on egypt and it was located in different um areas mm-hmm. even in different countries some of them oh, wow. and these stores called all eyes on egypt they would bring their money from what they were selling at their bookstore and they would give it to york give it to him i don't yes i don't even think they were getting paid for working at these stores Hmm. and they would just turn in all of their money to him from the all eyes on egypt bookstores so this is how he's able to sustain the land then uh, clearly Uh, yes when he has to come back in there (laughs) yes so so by the bookstores all eyes on egypt and he had a lot of products he was selling and he was selling his books and also people would come on the land um, visitors from the outside, they would come on the land and they would buy things that was being sold inside of the pyramid, different locations on the land. They would sell food and they would sell, you know, his, his, you know, incense and the soaps and deodorants that we were packing for free and, you know, working for free. He would sell those products on the land as well. And then he would have classes 
you know, maybe on Sundays or different days and people will come up there and they was buying stuff. And then he would have Savior's Day and that was around his birthday, June 26th, where people will come up and these people will come up from all over the world, all over from different places. Oh, and this was a, a big money making, you know, day mm-hmm. too. And this is his birthday celebration. Yep. Okay. Okay. So now we're on the land. So tell us, tell me just a little bit about if you can remember, uh, what do you think it was about him that drew people to him? Because clearly he had a lot of influence over people. And what do you think it was that drew him and made him so popular? I think um, the image that he tried, he portrayed to the the African-American community, especially during the 70s or the 80s, the time when the Ansara Law community first began, it Mm -hmm. was it was like as if it was like, you know, you know, the same way that the Black Panther Party and Black Panther movement was like, you know, this is foreign of the African-American people, you know, we're fighting for, you know, equality and, you know, whatever, you know, for it was like supposed to be for African-Americans. And I think that's what he portrayed himself to be like, you know, you come in here, this is the, the Islamic and Sarlaw community is holy, it's spiritual. This is a safe place for your children, all this stuff. And in the beginning, this is what people saw from the outside looking in. But what they didn't know, even during the times when it was the Ansar Law community, he was still raping and molesting underage, you know, children, uh, children and, you know, around that time. Yeah. And, you know, I'm and it's like I'm not sure, like if if people were aware of it or it was a, a secret that everyone kept quiet. But it was this molestation that he was you know doing it was going on all the way since the Ansar days and you know one girl she wound up getting pregnant by him and she was underage and they tried to say that her father gave um consent and her father did not give consent it's like the only reason why it was known that she was being molested is because she she wound up becoming pregnant but the molestation started when she was 12 years old and by this time York was in his 40s and she got pregnant at, at, at around maybe like 16 years old. So it's like this was even though from the outside, everyone looked at it like, oh, this is a holy place, a safe place, the neighborhood is clean. He was still doing some demonic activities to children. So what would people say? You know, because these are adults who, you know, seem to be in the right minds at some point. You know, even when before you go to the cult or before you go on the land, you know what's legal, what's not legal. You know, uh, how how was he able to keep these secrets, you know, amongst the people on the land? So I know that during the Ansar days, and this is what he did on the land as well. He had room workers that knew about the molestation that was going on. What kind so, of workers? I'm sorry, I missed that. What kind of room workers? room workers? Because the children were separated from their parents, and the the girls lived in one house, the boys lived in one house, and then the moms and the dads lived in another house, away from their children. All right, let's pause right there. Don't okay. I mean, hold your thought, but I have a question okay. about it because when we're looking at uh, ruthless, mm-hmm. um, the parents are definitely separated from their kids, and they yep. barely see them. Like, yes, you see them outside playing, but that's it. Like, you can't just walk up and say, hey, I want to mm-hmm. see my kid. Right. So and that's true a bit about that separation. So I know that when I was younger, I was in a room and it was a room worker that worked in a room with me and other girls my age. The only time that I remember seeing my mom.